الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا all praise due to Allah alone we praise him and we seek his help whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one and whomsoever Allah leaves astray none can show him guidance my dear brothers and sisters I'm very pleased to be amongst you tonight may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us what we don't know and guide us to implement and act upon the useful knowledge that we learn Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما والحمد لله على كل حال ونعوذ بالله من حال أهل النار In Surah Ar-Rum verse number 54 Allah the Almighty says أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الله الذي خلقكم من ضعف ثم جعل من بعد ضعف قوة ثم جعل من بعد قوة ضعفا وشيبة يخلق ما يشاء وهو العليم القدير it is Allah the Almighty who created you from the state of weakness when you were embryos. Then after you were born and you were toddlers, you were very vulnerable, babies, children, youth. Then he made the transition from weakness into strength. ثم جعل من بعد ضعف قوة ما شاء الله 16, 17, 18, 20 25, 27 lifting weight making like 10 miles jogging in the track or on the treadmill building muscles racing then eventually the curve doesn't keep going up forever it doesn't. Allah the Almighty drew the graph in this ayah where he said then after strength he made ضعفاً وشيبة the transition again is into weakness and senility into weakness and senility and in another ayah then after having knowledge the person will have no knowledge Sometimes even they forget their names. Subhanallah. This is how vulnerable, how weak the person becomes. So the ayah gives us a glimpse over the golden age. The best of the lifespan of any person, which is what? The stage of strength. The stage of quwa where the person must take advantage of the stage to the best of their ability. Because according to Al-Hasan al-Basri, may Allah have mercy on him, he says that every day that goes by, every day that the sun rises upon, it tells us, O oh son of Adam, take advantage of me. Take full advantage of me. Since... If I leave, I shall not come back until the day of judgment. I shall not come back until the day of judgment. And before that, in the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man istawa yawmahu fahuwa maghboon. Al-ghubn means zulm. When the person does wrong to himself, when the person does Injustice to his or her own self. How? If yesterday and today are alike, this is what the Prophet ﷺ said. If today and tomorrow will be alike, nothing new. You didn't learn anything new. You didn't benefit anything new. You didn't pile up a bunch of good deeds or hasanat more than yesterday. If the two days are alike, then the person have done injustice to himself. 
من استوى يومه فهو مغبون مسكين is a loser because the capital sum of the believer what is the capital sum of a believer how much do you possess how much do you need to have to say I'm a rich person the capital sum of the believer is time is his or her lifespan this is what we possess this is what we can actually make benefit out and that's why we have to take advantage of that and since the curve is shown by Allah the Almighty in this ayah and another ayah in Surah Al-Hajj and so on. So we know beforehand that you're strong today, you're powerful today. MashaAllah, you can do 200 jumping jacks. But very soon, you will end up praying sitting on the chair. Very soon, maybe you'll end up praying on your bed, on your spread. Why? Because this is a tradition of life. None of us is immortal. None of us is immune against the transitions of life and the changes which must take place in order to give a room for another generation. So each and every one of us, in order to take advantage, must leave a fingerprint. A fingerprint to be recognized not only by people, to be recognized by Allah, by his angels, by the righteous people. Being recognized by people isn't bad, by the way. It's a sign that, especially when there is either the vast majority of people or there is a general consensus where people say, we we'll miss this man. He used to be a good man. This man have taught us a lot. This man have done us a lot of favors. This man have served the community a lot of good. Once, a funeral passed in front of the Prophet ﷺ. His companions were sitting. They admired the dead person and said, Oh, Rasulullah, this man used to be, mashaAllah, very helpful. He used to be very righteous. He used to be a man of manners. He used to be a man of his word. He used to be very generous. So the Prophet ﷺ remarked saying, Wajabat. They didn't really understand what he meant by saying wajabat, so they let go. Then another funeral, while they were sitting, passed by. They did not admire that dead person like the first one. Rather, they said the opposite. So, Alhamdulillah, finally you got rid of him. He was such a troublesome man. He was such an evil person. He was such, he was such. So the Prophet ﷺ remarked saying, wajabat. Some of the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, ma wajabat. In the first time you said wajabat, when we said this man was good. And in the second time you also said the same thing, wajabat. The same remark. The word wajabat means do, confirmed. Yani, he said, amma al-awwal, as for the first person, for the first dead person, you admired him, fa wajabat lahu al-jannah. Because you admire them and all of you, there was like a general consensus that this man used to be a good man. So wajabat lahu jannah he is due to enter paradise, has been confirmed. As for the later person, because you, you did the opposite, فَوَجَبَتْ لَهُ النَّارِ He is due to enter her fire. Why? He said, because أَنْتُمْ شُهُودُ اللَّهِ فِي الْأَرْضِ You are the witnesses of Allah on earth. So your testimony, whenever you testify for the favor of somebody, especially, you know, there is no reason to forge your testimony. All of you, the Sahaba, are testifying for the favor of somebody, or again is it wajabat. So, in this very short lifespan of ours, especially this youth period, the golden age, we find the Prophet ﷺ had advised us repeatedly to take advantage of this time. Listen when he says, اغتنم. The word اغتنم غنيمة means the war booty, the war spoils. Take it, take advantage of. Seize this opportunity, never waste it. Take advantage of your health before you get sick. Take advantage of your wealth before you turn poor. Take advantage of your life before you expire. Take advantage of your youth before you get old. 
and so on. I'm pretty sure you all know the sound hadith in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there are seven categories of people whom Allah the Almighty will shelter with a shade which he will create specially for them on the day of judgment. Are you all familiar with this hadith? Sab'atun yudhilluhum Allahu fi dhillih. Something little irrelevant to the topic, but it's very important to clarify because once this hadith is mentioned, many, many ordinary Muslims and even some seekers of knowledge assume the word fi dhillihi, his shade, that he will have a shade. And this is absolutely false. Because to have a shade, you have to have a source of light on top of you. And there is nothing above Allah. Do you think that the sun will be above Allah and will create a shade and he have, uh, you know, borders and limits and boundaries? Absolutely false. So why did he say, fi dhillihi, in his shade? In a shade which he will create to shelter those lucky people. May Allah make myself and you brothers and sisters and our loved ones amongst those whom Allah will shelter under his shade on the day when there will not be any shade but his. Now you know the word his shade means what? Okay? Not his personal shade. So one of those seven categories, and it's not seven individuals, seven types of people. One of those seven categories, شاب نشأ في عبادة الله A young man, شاب, a young man who grew up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? I believe the mission of those seven categories of people, this is the hardest one of all of them, the hardest achievement. Because one of those categories to give any charity so privately so that your left hand doesn't know how much your right hand have spent. صح? Even if you do that once, huh? But make sure that you don't just keep the pocket change in your pocket beforehand. You know that it's a few, uh, few quarters and you just donate them. So if you do it once, you're one of them. But to maintain the state of stability and steadfastness on the straight path throughout your youth so that it will grow up with you and you will grow old and the steadfastness will grow stronger as you grow older isn't easy. Isn't easy. But it's achievable. How? First of all, whether for the youth, for the elders, for the youngsters, Allah the Almighty have taught all of us in Surah Al-Ahzab, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Indeed, for you, for the believers, in the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the best role model, so the greatest example to be followed for you, for the believers, for those who believe in Allah, and in the last day, is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So if I'm going to share with the youth, with the elders, with the youngsters, with women, with any category of Muslims, anything, then we must set the example, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Then you can provide references from his companions, from our predecessors, from uh, at tabi'in from the scholars. But how can you just speak about good conduct or great achievements without setting the example, the role model, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the hadith, which is collected by Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullahu ta'ala, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to the elders, said to the elders, استوصوا بالشباب خيرا. Take good care of the youth. Take good care of the youth. I enjoin upon you to be kind, to be gentle, to be merciful with the youth. This is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? He said, indeed Allah has sent me with the truth. بالحنفية السمحاء. Yet, حالفني الشباب. 
وخالفني الشيوخ حالفني خالفني the difference is just a dot on the top of the letter خا but it makes a big difference حالفني الشباب those who followed me were of the youth Abu Bak was a young man Umar al-Khattab, Uthman, Ali, Zayd, uh, Ammar ibn Yasir, um, uh, Musab ibn Umayyad, they were all youth, even in Medina. And who opposed him? As shuyukh, the elders. They are, you know, they resent any changes or any reform in general. Of course, there are some exceptions. But this is what the Prophet ﷺ stated, and it is a fact. So when we address the youth here or today with a few advices, it doesn't mean at all that, that we have a very bitter taste against them or we feel that they are all naughty and they misbehave. No, it's simply because the Prophet ﷺ said, Take good care of them because those who supported me from the beginning were the youth, while those who opposed me and fought against me and led the campaigns against me were the elders. Okay? They don't want to change. But also Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa taught the youth a lot of lessons. For innocence, he said, Laysa minna man lam yuwakkir kabirana. One who does not honor our elders doesn't belong to us. Not because, alhamdulillah, I've been seeking knowledge and maybe you've got your masters, your ijaza in the six books of hadith, your ijaza in the seven thin dialects of the Quran and uh, mashallah, you have become very well versed in fiqh that you deal with the elders as they are a bunch of ignorant and they don't know much and we have to give them the right position. La, la. That was not the attitude of Rasulullah sallallahu If you truly belong to this ummah, you better understand the following. He said sallallahu alayhi wasallam, one who does not honor the elders doesn't belong to us. No matter how high you get in any position or any position, even including knowledge, you still, you still like that before the elders, but you know better and you know more. Learn from the Rafa, from the Rifq, from the kindness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Stop being judgmental of others, especially the sinners. Whether elders or youth of your age or younger. Because this is a dilemma. This is killing any person including the person who has become well versed in the deen with regards to memorizing because if he doesn't understand, he is simply half of. Yet to implement only after he comprehends what we have, what he has learned. Yani, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam happened to see a Bedouin who got up and he passed urine, he literally urinated in the masjid. Whenever you learned about this hadith, and I'm pretty sure that you have heard this hadith many times before. Whenever you read or you have learned this hadith, did you ever imagine experiencing anything like that? Did you ever imagine positioning yourself in the position of the Sahaba and what would you have done in case that somebody simply got up in the masjid and he started urinating? Did you ever think about it? Guess what? It happened right in front of my eyes. In one of the most beautiful masajid, and they got the carpet imported from, handmade from here and there, very expensive. We prayed Fajr, and this guy just got up, unzipped his pants, and he relieved himself. Right in the middle of the masjid. Subhanallah, just imagine what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? I didn't say what would he have done. No, because he have done that already. So when the Sahaba rushed towards this man to beat him up, to kick him out of the masjid, to throw him away, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not address the man. Rather, he addressed them. He said, "La tahzimu, 
Don't scare him off. Don't scare him off. He said, Da'u, leave him. Let him finish. <laughs> I wallahi. I swear he said, let him finish. And this is sound hadith. Let him finish. Then when he finished, he drew near to him and said, just bring me a bucket of water, pour it over his urine, and we'll take care of it. Then he spoke to him in private and he said, my brother, he's a bad one, illiterate. You know, he said, my brother, this is masjid, this is a place of worship. We do not answer the call of nature here. You got to go outside and say, so when the man saw how kind was Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa to him versus what the Sahaba did to him, you know, they wanted to beat him up. The Prophet ﷺ utilized the wisdom which Allah the Almighty bestowed upon him. Imagine if he was on the run while he is still dripping urine all over. So instead of soiling and contaminating one single spot, <laughs> he would be riding all over the masjid. <laughs> now let him finish in that spot. We will clean the spot after he finishes. And don't scare him off because if you do, he may leave and never ever come back. May never ever come back. Why? Because it is our behavior which either attracts or wears people off. Once in one of the malls in Texas, I was doing something in, in, in a shop we used to call mother care. Then the cashier, the girl, figured out that my name is Muhammad. Oh, you are a Muslim. I said, yes. She said, I'm Muslim too. Which to me, she didn't look like a Muslim. I said, oh, great. And uh, why don't you go to the masjid? She said, I used to. And what happened? She said, I quit. Why did you quit? It is very important to understand why. In order to avoid it, in order to fix the problem. She said, as you see, I'm, I'm a poor woman. I support myself. I have to work hard to support myself. Most of the community members, the Muslim community members, are rich people. They all drive Mercedes and Lexus and all of that. And when they get together for dinner, their women, they keep bragging about their latest year model, their diamond ring, their Rolex watch, their car key, and the silk fabric. And I sit in the middle of them like, I don't belong here. <laughs> I don't belong here. This is now my place. So that's why she quit. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna minkum munafireen. He said that to the Sahaba. Some of you are repellent. They were people of, they make them hate the deen. Because of their misbehavior. You know when he said so? It's a very interesting story. Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu an is a great sahabi. He used to have very melodious voice. He lived far away from al-Mashid al-Nabawi. And whenever his people asked him to lead the prayer, the Isha prayer, the late prayer, he said, no, 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 no. I love to pray behind the Prophet sallallahu He's a young man. He can walk back and forth even in the darkness. They said, but we love to hear your voice. What about this? Why don't you go ahead and pray Isha with the Prophet and we'll be waiting for you here. You come and lead us again for Isha prayer. This is a sound hadith. And this is one of the references which the Shafi'i uses that a, a person who's praying nafila can lead the prayer for a person who is praying fard. Okay, it's not just a story. It has many interesting references. One of them is in fiqh. So he started doing so. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would finish the Isha, he will pray with him. And when he finishes, he will go to his neighborhood and join them. He would lead them in the Isha prayer. But Mu'adh ibn Jabal has memorized a lot of Quran and he would just keep reciting forever. So one of those guys who was a handyman, <coughs> he used to <coughs> fetch water. By the time it's Isha time, he is falling apart. He cannot stay awake. So in the prayer, he keeps dozing off. So one day, because Mu'ad ibn Jabal kept praying, reciting long recitation, they, they complained to the Prophet Wasallam. So he ordered him to recite a lighter recitation, shorter surahs, for Aisha. Fajr, he can pray a long, uh, recite a long recitation. 
But this man one day couldn't take it anymore. So he was not able to stand in the Aisha prayer, so he left. He left the Salah. After he left, some people told Mu'ad ibn Jabal about him. He said, he's a munafiq. That's why he left the prayer. How dare you leave the congregation? You're a munafiq. And trust me, this is what, what any of us do or say. Sah? So this man heard that Mu'ad ibn Jabal, very honorable companion, labeled him with nifaq, disbelief. So he went to the Prophet وسلم, and he complained to him, the kind-hearted man. He said, this is what I do for a living. I cannot afford to wait for, yeah, and in addition to standing up for long recitation. So the Prophet وسلم, called Mu'ad ibn Jabal and he was very mad at him. Even though he loved him so much, he said to him, in one hadith, Ya Mu'ad, inni uhibbuk. I love you. Not that Mu'ad said to the Prophet, I love you, because all the companions loved him. But the Prophet Sallallahu did not say that, but to a couple companions. He said to Mu'ad, Ya Mu'ad, inni uhibbuk. I love you. But during this time, he was very mad at him. And he said, Anna min munafirin. Some of you are repentant. Some of you were people of. Send them away from the deen. من صلى بالناس whoever leads a prayer فليخفف يا أخي رصات والشمس وضحاها والليل إذا يغشى والضحى and so on so رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم would not tolerate mistreating anyone معاذ بن جبل was a mount of knowledge that's why the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم chose him to send him to Yemen a whole country to be their judge, to be their imam, to be their ruler, their leader, because he's got it all, mashallah. But he still needs to learn how to behave with others, especially people whom you may think that they're sinners, even if they're sinners. So the Prophet ﷺ brought this bad one who just urinated in the masjid near and he patted on his shoulder and he taught him that, you know, he can't do that in the masjid because we pray here. He said, I swear to the one who sent you the truth, I didn't know that. I thought I can just do it anywhere. Bad words. Sometimes when we go for hajj, and this is very common, in the hotels, where they have sometimes escalators, throwing the stones, they have escalators. You see some elders, they have never seen an escalator in their life. They think it's a shaitan moving. <laughs> shaitan is mo jinn is moving the stairs. Stairs are moving? No way that I'm getting on that shaitan. And people, please, will support you, will help you. Then you find a person who has zero conduct, zero etiquette. Move it old lady. Ah, you're coming for Hajj, and you think yourself, MashaAllah, you know it all. And this is how you behave with the elders. Because she had never seen an escalator before. She was never introduced to an elevator. And we see that instead of joining hands and trying to assist her, even carry her, give her some security, because it's not only one escalator, if you're throwing the stones, you need to take 10 escalators. SubhanAllah, this is just an example of many, many examples. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us that you should never ever be judgmental of others. Especially when you think yourself too good. And this is another crisis. Thinking of yourself that you are very righteous. Insha'Allah, you've done a lot for the ummah. You've done a lot for the community. You've done a lot for yourself and your family. Masha'Allah, it couldn't be better. That is the worst case scenario. When you keep admiring yourself, you, even if you don't talk about it, when you have that feeling in your heart, you know in Surah Al-Najm, Allah the Almighty says what? فَلَا أَنفُسَكُمْ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ اتَّقَى Don't you admire yourselves? He knows best who is righteous and who is not. You know, you don't need to introduce yourself to Allah. He already knows whether you're righteous or not. So keep it between you and Allah. But to admire yourself, this is very problematic. And sometimes it happens at one stage when shaitan fails to seduce you into sexuality, 
into haram earning, into any whatever. So he puts the seed of arrogance or ujb in your heart. You're too good, mashallah. You don't even commit sins, mashallah. Musa ibn al-Kazim said once in al Madina, this is one of the great scholars, says about another scholar by the name Muhammad ibn Muqatil. Bismillah. He says, once there was a quake, an earthquake in Medina, and a hurricane with red wind. So we were very frightened. And we went to Muhammad ibn Muqatil, the great scholar that even Imam al-Shafi'i was, I'm sorry, Imam al-Bukhari was his student, Ahmad ibn Hanbal. They have narrated a hadith from him. They have learned from him. So he went to him and he said, Oh, the only person who can make dua on Allah will accept his dua. And please pray for us, pray for Medina and so on. What did he say? He said, I'm afraid actually this earthquake have happened because of me. Because of my faults. Because of my shortcomings. To distract the attention of people from him being, thinking of him that he is the best, he is the most righteous. So he turned everything upside down. He said, I'm actually afraid that this earthquake happened because of my bad omen, because of my shortcomings. Subhanallah. So, after all settled, Muhammad, Musa ibn al-Qasim, the narrator said, I saw in my dream that Allah the Almighty had protected al Madina and stopped the earthquake and the wind, the violent wind, because of the dua of Muhammad ibn Muqatil. Don't tell people how good you are. Allah knows and he's going to inform people about you. Sometimes a person is, mashallah, Allah bless them with a ibadah, which is khafiyah, hidden. Like what? He gets up at night to pray. Shaitan doesn't know how to get around him, how to mess up his prayer, how to mess up. So he will mess up his act through the hidden shirk, which is ujb. He likes what he did. And he tends to show off, even without saying a word. So next morning, he's going to school or he's going to work. He has red eyes. This colleague says, are you okay? Did you get some rest? You have red eyes? Yeah, I've, not. I've been praying all night. <laughs> you messed the whole thing up. You ruined it. You ruined it. This little seed, this little evil seed is in the heart of each and every one of us. But when shaitan fails to bring one of the ordinary people into a major sin, he will bring a scholar or a righteous person into this act of shirk through this seed of ujb. He will work on investing in this seed. Al-Asma'i narrated that once a young man was praying in the masjid. And he was praying by himself with full hushua. Two people walked into the masjid. So one noticed this young man was praying with hushua. So he spoke to the other guy. said, look, look, look. Have you ever seen anyone praying with hushua like that? Look at his hushua. MashaAllah. So they started talking about this person. This person who's supposed to be in hushua. Hearing nothing, focusing on the prayer. So this guy in the prayer, look at this, and guess what? I'm fasting too. <laughs> Couldn't resist that urge. Couldn't resist that urge. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, the best of this ummah, after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever somebody would admire him, he used to say, and listen to this dua and learn it. Allahumma ja'anni khayran mimma yadhunnoon. Waghfir li ma la ya'lamoon. Wa la tu'akhithni bima yaqoolun. Oh Allah, make me better than what they think of me. When people think good of you, that's a good sign. But don't mess it up. Ask Allah to make you as much as they think of you or even better. He said better than what they think of me. And forgive me what they have no 
idea about. Because there are sins that I do in private. You, me, and every one of us. And don't blame me for what they say about me. I didn't ask them to admire me. I'm not admiring myself. I didn't ask anyone to admire me. So I'm not blameworthy in this regard. Just make me better than what they think of me and forgive me what they do not know about me. In the second hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there used to be two people amongst the Israelites. One of them was super righteous and one of them was a sinner. But they were friends, they were brothers. So every time the righteous man sees the sinner committing a sin, he would enjoin him to do what is good, forbid him again is the evil, and the other person would say, leave me to my Lord, he shall forgive me. Leave me with my Lord, he shall forgive me. Until one day he saw him committing a terrible sin. So he uttered the following word. He said, Wallahi, لَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكَ أَبَدًا I swear Allah will never forgive you. By the way, it was in an odd statement that was said hundreds of years ago, or only in the Israelites. I hear this a lot from the young seekers of knowledge. When Alhamdulillah, they start practicing and they go for Fajr in the congregation and they memorize some parts of the Quran and they wear the thawb and they grow the beard. They're supposed to be better, but for some reason, you know, for some reason, their family members, they notice the changes to the worse. It has become very violent. It has become very not strict because you can be strict in halal and haram, but your family members, your colleagues, your neighbors would feel that you become softer to them, kinder to them because now you're implementing what you have learned. But what is happening is the opposite. What is happening that you've become judgmental of others' faith and faith. You're a mubtada, and you're of the manhaj, and you're going to hell, and you shall never enter paradise. You don't know what you're saying. Wallahi, you don't know what you're saying. You don't know what you're messing up with. Guess what? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when this man said so, he said this word, Wallahi, you shall never enter paradise. Wallahi, you shall go to stay to hell. So Allah the Almighty sent the angel of death. He collected the souls of both. Then he revived them both. And he said to the one who was super righteous, من ذا الذي يتألى علي تألي means to swear who has the guts to swear in my name to send whom to heaven and whom to hell who gave you an access who gave you the right to swear in my name that he's not going to heaven and rather he's going to hell guess what I forgave him all his sins and he said to the angels take him to my paradise by my mercy it's my heaven Take him to my paradise. And he said to the one who used to be super, super righteous, and I did not accept a single good deed of yours. Take him to hellfire. That's a sound hadith, brothers and sisters. That keeps us always in the condition of uncertainty of what? Of our faith. We have husn al-zan. We hope and pray that if Allah forgive that sinner and the man who killed 100 souls and, 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 and of all of those people, then I hope that he will forgive me my sins too. But be careful, lest you think too good of yourself to enter hellfire. No, 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 not me. <laughs> you know, if everybody else, not me. I know I'm going to, subhanallah. Uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu an once attended a majlis in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, <clears throat> on the day of judgment, Al-Jannah has how many gates? And An-Nar, how many gates? Huh? How many gates? You don't want to know about it, right? <laughs> Seven. لَهَا سَبْعَةُ أَبْوَابٍ لِكُلِّ بَابٍ مِّنْهُمْ جُزْءٌ مَقْسُورٌ The eight gates of Al-Jannah, each gate will call upon the dwellers of Al-Jannah who shall enter from this gate because there is speciality. So Al-Rayyan for the fasting people. 
There is a gate for the charitable. There is a gate for a shuhada. There is a gate for this. There is a gate for that. And Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an says, Ya Rasulullah, is it possible that anyone will be called upon from the eight gates? Huh? Look at the high zeal. Look at the ambitions. Not just to enter Al-Jannah, but to enter where the all eight gates will be competing over you. No, 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 come and enter from me. No, enter through me. He said, yes, ya Abu Bakr, and I pray that you'll be one of them. <laughs> That's an indication that he will be amongst them. Subhanallah. And he's already given the Bishara, the first of the ten heaven pound companions is Abu Bakr Siddiq. Yet, Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, says that by Allah, if already one of my feet is in paradise, but the other one is still outside, I don't feel secure. I don't feel safe until I make it completely and entirely inside Al-Jannah. Otherwise, I still fear that I may not make it. This is the proper feeling and this is the true belief of worrying about yourself. Stop being judgmental of others' faith, especially I'm talking about the Muslimin. And have husnul dhan. Have husnul dhan. Shaitan may keep you busy with judging others because she's doing this, he's doing that, and he's not on the proper manhaj, and he's doing whatever. And because he's smoking, smoking is haram definitely. Because he's smoking, he shall not enter paradise. You never know. I'm going to share something with you, brothers and sisters. I used to go for proper da'wah. We gather in the masjid, attend the halqa, then we spread in the streets. We go and visit the coffee shops in Egypt, walk in the streets, invite people to come and pray, give them the perfume, teach them how to make wudu. We have a, a plan, a strategy, okay? Not to embarrass them. So when somebody will be sitting in the wudu area all the time, keep making wudu. So that because those people, they're Muslims, born Muslims, but they never done wudu in their lives. So not to embarrass them because they are elders, not to tell them, that, oh, you're too old and you don't know how to make wudu. So in a state, somebody is sitting, making wudu, and again making wudu, and again making wudu. And we, we see people trying to imitate this person, and we take turns, not to embarrass them, not to hurt their feeling. We're here to bring them close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then one of those guys, we went to visit him, and he was in his last year of college, studying business administration. And subhanAllah, yani, I feel sorry for him that he doesn't pray. He plays cards. He smokes drugs, drinks. You know, everything is messed up. So alhamdulillah, visiting him a few times while he's having all of that around. You know, once he decided to come to the masjid, then he liked it. Sometimes he would keep the cigarette in, in, the, in the shoe, cigarette box. So, you know, it's very wrong, especially when a person is a beginner, you know, to get carried away. How could you take this cigarette box inside the masjid and you crumble it and you throw it away? Because again, okay, I'm not coming anymore. He still, you know, you need to attract him. So he started coming. And gradually, he became regular. He loved the deal. He started learning how to read Quran because he was blanco, zero. Okay? And subhanAllah, in a couple of years, he memorized the entire Quran. Then subhanAllah, I missed him and said, what happened to this person? They said that he went to study uh, somewhere. And later on, I figured that he spent six years or so with Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen. Studying under him. May Allah have mercy on him. He became very well versed in fatwa to the point that they appointed him in a charge for, you know, managing the fatwa, electronic fatwa. And the time has come where I, I am the one who used to lead the prayer. He used to pray behind me. We brought him to the masjid. We made him quit this and this and that. Now, I proudly pick up the phone to consult him. Sheikh, I have a question. <laughs> Ya yeah, wallahi, believe it or not. Believe it or not. 
You must have heard about the other sheikh in Tunisia who narrated this. I heard it from him uh, personally. He said, again, they used to go out and bring people. So he said, you know, they spoke like to over a hundred person. Not a single person agreed to come to the masjid except for one. It was very easy going. Come to the masjid. Oh, okay. Take me to the masjid. He went to the masjid. And the person who brought him, he was a young man. Like my age when I brought him. A teenager. So when he brought him to the masjid, and this is a grown-up man, the one who is coming to the masjid for the first time. And he was happy because no one else was able to bring anyone to the masjid but him. So once he brought him to the masjid, subhanallah, he didn't feel what is happening, but he just noticed that everybody was throwing their shoes at them and beating them with the shoes. And... He was going crazy, he doesn't understand what is happening. He tried to protect the guest until the Imam showed up and said, stop it. Then he came, he says, he came to me, he said, son, take your guest outside. I said, why, Sheikh? He, I brought him to the masjid. He said, your guest is drunk. <laughs> Don't you smell? He said, I have no idea what alcohol smells like. <laughs> so that's why he, he stinks. Your guest is drunk. He said, no wonder he was easy with me to come. I said, come, he came. So I said, look, uh, please, he can come back tomorrow. And uh, he said, I'm not going nowhere. And he was so stubborn that I'm not going nowhere. I'm staying here. They want to call Iqama so that they can pray. But the man won't move. So he said, I told him, made him make wudu. Then when we came to stand up in the line, no one wanted to stand next to him because of the smell. He stinks. So he said, I stood between him and the line and they left a huge gap. We, we stood in the line by ourselves. We prayed. And subhanallah, after the prayer, we thought because the man doesn't know how to pray, that he fell asleep after the prayer. He was still in sujood. Uncle, let's go. Uncle, let's go. He won't move. They checked him out. He have died. A man who have never prayed in his life, he dies while praying. Allah chose for him the good ending. So you never know. You may think of somebody he is so evil. And I have done that a lot. My office in the media city, this is like Hollywood. Okay. My office next door is a channel where they have those dancers and they dance, you know, have nude, have naked, and all of that. So, and we have a musalla. So I deliberately stand up and I call Adhan and uh, in front of my office. They pass by in the corridor and they keep laughing and making those, you know, dirty moves. So in the salah, I curse them. Say, oh Allah, destroy them. Oh Allah, kill them. Oh Allah, curse them. They are Muslims, but belly dancers, you know. So one day my wife was visiting, and she went to the restroom, and she found those girls were doing their makeup before the show and so on. So when she took a long time, she came and said, what took you so long? She said, I was talking to these girls next door, and I was giving them that. I said, never mind. You don't know, those are very evil people. She said, no. You know what the girl said to me? She said, Wallahi, I'm working to feed myself. If I find a man who would pay for my rent and utilities, I know I'm doing haram, but I don't have any other source. I wasn't able to control my emotions. And I felt very little. I was like an ant or even smaller. You think yourself, you're a big sheikh and you become judgmental of others and in it, Wallahi, ever since my wife told me that, I changed. Alhamdulillah, shukla. So I know that they're very evil, but in my sujood, I keep praying for them. I pray for those dancers, for those lady belly dancers, for those boys who are working there. And whenever I have a chance, I invite one of them to the office and I speak to them. So subhanallah, a few weeks ago, I got a message from one of them says probably on my page and I still have it probably you don't remember me but one day invited me to your office and that visit have changed my life alhamdulillah for the past uh, four years 
Uh, I've been living in Saudi Arabia. I performed Hajj four times and I keep praying for you. This little meeting have changed my life. I wasn't, I wasn't sure that one day I will quit this job. But wallahi, since I quit this job, Allah opened all the doors of goodness for me and things have become Astaghfirullah al-Azim. Stop being judgmental of others. Stop thinking evil of others. You never know. Especially when they are, when they say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. How often, especially the youth, and I'm one of the youth, am I not? We get carried away because we see somebody doing something wrong. So, right away we issue the verdict. No. That can ruin you personally. If you are truly seeking knowledge and talibu ilm, who have learned anything in the deen of Allah, you should feel pity for them. You should be merciful to them. You should make dua for them. If your dua, if you think that your dua will be accepted, if you think, Ya Allah, burn them in hell. Ya Allah, destroy them. And you assume that your dua will be answered. So why don't you use it for a better cause? Oh Allah, guide them. So that is, huh? Better for you and for them. And there is a reference in the sound hadith in this regard. What is the reference? The reference is, once they used to be a companion, yes, a companion, you heard it right, who was an alcoholic. Alcoholic? How dare you say that about the Sahaba? Yeah, because before Islam, they used to drink, and they were alcoholic, and women were prostitutes. All of that was common. They accepted Islam. And this companion couldn't quit drinking. He was caught. He was punished. And he was cut again, and he was punished. And he was cut again, and he was punished. In public, he was lashed and flogged. So when they returned once from flogging him, one of the Sahaba said, لَعَنَكَ Allah, May Allah curse you. Won't you ever stop? How many times will you be flogged and beaten? You should stop. لَعَنَكَ Allah, And he cursed him. Oh, Rasulullah wasallam heard that. SubhanAllah. He said, how dare you say that? لا تكن عونا للشيطان على أخيك. You shouldn't be assisting Satan against your brother. Rather, you should pray for him. Look what Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says. He says, when you see a sinner, instead of mocking at him, instead of cursing him and praying against him, rather pray for him and pray for yourself. What do you say for yourself? سل الله العافية. Ask Allah to protect you. This is a very beautiful dua. What is your name? Huh? Harith. Ya yeah, Harith. If you see anyone in your school whose name is Muhammad or Ahmed and he doesn't pray, besides making dua for him, asking Allah to make him pray, say, Alhamdulillah, that he have made me a good Muslim. Alhamdulillah, alladhi afani. Thanks to Allah for protecting me against the evil which others are being afflicted with. We used to have an imam who used to lead us in the prayer for years. And every time he would recite Quran, people have to cry. To that extent, he was so righteous. One day he quit praying completely. <laughs> and he opened a store in America where I went to visit him like he is you know, like inviting a non-Muslim to Islam. <laughs> He got married to an American woman selling haram and khalas, even Jumu'ah. And the masjid is a walking distance. Wallahi, he wouldn't even come for Jumu'ah. What does this mean? What does this signify? No one is safe. So long as you are in this life, there is always a struggle. Satan said, I shall mislead them all. I shall give them hope in life to live forever. I shall give them this and this and that. Making certain that they will all go astray. Then he said in another ayah, Illa ibadaka minhumul mukhlasin. Except your chosen servants. I can't do anything with them. But are you certain you're one of them? Husnul khatima. The good conclusion, the good ending of life is something that no one knows. That's why the person have to remain in a state of hope and fear. Hope and fear. The youth must be reminded of that more than anybody else. 
When the person, alhamdulillah, is doing their five daily prayers, when the person is attending classes and learning Quran, then he sees others, on the other hand, wicked, then automatically, without feeling, without realizing, he thinks himself high and better than others. You never know. I can keep giving you examples of the past, of the hadith, of the sunnah, and also from the Quran, and also from our experience until tomorrow morning. But for the sake of time, I want to also share another thing with you. We said in the beginning, our role model was Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So our role model sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us in this particular matter, even though his personal satisfaction, this, this person is a munafiq, but he never showed. Who was the head of the munafiqeen? Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, right? Was it a secret that Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul was a munafiq? No, it wasn't. Even the Quran says, quoted what he said in Surah Al-Munafiqoon, revealed to expose the hypocrisy of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. But when he died, the Prophet sallallahu talk of his aba'ah, his outer garment, and he said, shroud him in his aba'ah. Then he went to lead the funeral prayer. Umar ibn Khattab couldn't take it. He got up and he stood on the face of the Prophet ﷺ between him and the Qibla and said, I will not let you lead the prayer. I will not let you, you pray for this munafiq. He's a munafiq. And the Prophet ﷺ kindly, Ya Umar, move away. Move away. Move away, Ya Umar. Leave me alone. Leave me with my companions, Ya Umar. Ya hey, Rasulullah, you know he's a munafiq. Leave me alone. Then Allah the Almighty revealed the ayah استغفر لهم أو لا تستغفر لهم إن تستغفر لهم سبعين مرة فلن يغفر الله لهم Listen to this For people like Abdullah ibn Ubaim Salul pure munafiqin whether you seek forgiveness for them or you don't because Salatul Janaza is seeking forgiveness whether you seek forgiveness for them or you don't even if you continue to seek forgiveness for them 70 times Allah will never forgive them Okay, end of story. No, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa commented on that saying, Wallahi, if I know that if I were to make istighfar more than 70 times, Allah would accept it, I would have made it. It's all about the heart. It's all about being, you know, kind, gentle, with a good heart. Not pretending, but being natural. You love people. You love goodness for people. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, I don't know whether you're going to believe this or not. One day, Allah made me pick up the phone. Somebody whom I don't know. Yes. Said, uh, I'm a cab driver. Did any of you go to Egypt or study in Egypt? No? Okay. So, I said, how can I help you? He said, I'm here at Cairo airport. And uh, there is an American tourist. And he's riding with me. I want to make him Muslim. I said, okay, good for you, make him Muslim. He said, I don't know English. I said, okay, how am I supposed to help you? Between me and him, almost two hours driving. <laughs> you know, I'm in my office, I have a live show in a little bit, and, and this guy wants to make somebody whom I have no clue about both of them, he wants to make him Muslim. He said, okay, but how can I help you? I said, I want you to talk to him. I said, look, if you want to bring him, I'll get you a permit, both of you, and he can come to my office. He said, I will bring him even if you are in the moon. So I gave him the address. I got him the permit. And subhanallah, he came with the American tourist to my office. I don't know neither one of them. So the guy walked in and he said, so you are uh, like a priest, like a, a scholar of Islam? I said, I just know a little bit. He said, okay, I have a few questions for you. One, two, three, four. He kept asking about 20 questions. And I wasn't suggesting anything. He was just asking. And after he, uh, he finished his uh, questions and I, I finished answering, he said, oh, okay, I'm ready to become a Muslim. A Muslim. I thought he's faking it, to be honest with you. You know, that was easy. It wasn't even an hour. I said, but first, do you know what is Islam? And do you know... 
what it tastes. And he said, look, those questions I have been asking for the past 20 years in America. And every time I go to church and I ask those questions, they kick me out and the priest put a restraining order against me. Don't come to our church anymore. Your religion is the only religion that gives me a, you know, a, you know, a, a answer that makes sense. So I kept talking to him and, you know, the requirements and, um, you know, the belief of Muslims. He said, I'm ready. So I uh, said, repeat after me. He gave, I gave him the shahada and I got up to hug him and I feel the vibration coming out of his heart. And he was a doctor, an American doctor, white American doctor. Then I gave him my number in the States. I said, anytime you need anything, just phone me and, uh, because I'm always traveling. And subhanAllah, a while later, this cab driver calls me and he brings another American guy. But this time, he was a young man, but he was, you know, I met him once or twice, but he showed interest, but he didn't accept Islam though. Then a while later, he calls me and said, Sheikh, Sheikh, Sheikh. I said, yes. They have somebody else I said, no, you remember that doctor? I said, yes. He said, I took him home. I gave him one of my soap and I taught him how to pray. And he fasted for the whole month of Ramadan. Allahu Akbar. MashaAllah. I said, Sheikh, and wallahi, 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 he died in his sujood while he was praying. He fasted the whole month of Ramadan. And then when he was praying, he died in his sujood. Six months after he accepted Islam. He never returned back to America. You mean that this cab driver got to enter heaven through bringing somebody from the middle of nowhere to Islam and to save him to enter heaven? That's called Allah's plan. That's called Allah's plan, which neither you nor me nor anyone have any clue about it. So what you need to do is husnul dhan, husnul khuluq to think good of Allah, to expect good from Allah, to have hope in Allah, but also to be cautious and to have good conduct because there is nothing that brings you closer to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in paradise better, better than having good conduct. Let me wrap it up with one thing. We said we learn from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Once our most beloved sallallahu alayhi wa got a gift, beautiful uh, ring. Beautiful ring. And he was sitting with his companions. So he would talk to them and would look at the ring. Mm, mashallah, nice. He would look at them and look at the ring. Then all of a sudden he took the ring off and he threw it away. What happened? Is it haram? He said, no. It kept me busy from you. It diverted my attention from you. Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> You know, you know how many hours I sit with my parents or with my mother and she's talking to me. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And, oh, yeah, 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 I hear you. I follow you. You're only following this. Did you understand what I mean by narrating the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ threw away the ring because it diverted his attention from his Companions who are sitting with him, adab, etiquette. When you're sitting with people, especially with the elders, either be listening or dismissed, not to impose your views and opinions, or not to be busy from them, especially the parents doing this. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on him. When his mother sent him to learn from Rabia, she said, listen, I want you to learn from his Adab first before his ilm. Learn from his etiquette and conduct before picking up from his knowledge. This is most important for me. And when Imam al-Shafi'i, Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, his mother sent him from Gaza to study in Medina. And he was sitting, Imam Malik was narrating the hadith, he narrated 40 hadith. And every time he narrates a hadith with the chain of the narrators, he comes all the way to the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, from the man who is in this place, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he points to him. So he notes that Imam al-Shafi'i was rather busy playing with a straw against his hand. He was very offended and very angry with him. Then after he finished, he said, come, 
when I say Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I say it. How could you be playing? How, do you could, how could you keep yourself busy playing with your hand? When I'm saying Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say, he said, Wallahi, I wasn't playing. He said, I saw you don't lie to me. He said, I wasn't playing. I don't have money to buy a pen and ink. So I wet the straw with my saliva and I write on my palm. He didn't believe him yet. He said, if you're true, just narrate one hadith. He, meant, he, he narrated 40 hadith in his setting. He said, narrate one hadith if you're true. Because look, if you're busy, you are not paying attention to anything. Allah said, مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ No one has two hearts in his Oh, Only one heart, one mind, to think about one thing at a time. صح? So Imam al-Shafi'i, Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, narrated all the 40 ahadith with the chain of the narrators, the same order pointing to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa maqam and so on. So he said, man, you're blessed. And because you're blessed, I want to advise you, knowledge is nur. Do not Turn off this nur with sins. Do not put out this nur which Allah put in your heart through committing sins. Brothers and sisters, Wallahi talking doesn't finish. And a hadith, mashallah, we have thousands of ahadith and thousands of ayat. What matters most over the past one, and one hour and five minutes is that if we learn one thing, not two, not three, not five, just one thing, the etiquette of dealing with the elders, the the importance of, instead of praying against others, praying for them. The significance of not being judgmental of others' fate, rather worrying about yourself. And it does not mean at all that you neglect them, or you ignore them and say, God will take care of them, I have nothing to do with them, it's none of my business. No, to be proactive, but leave the fate up to Allah. Because not, you don't even know your own faith. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us for his best. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار اللهم هيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا واجعلنا من عبيدك السعداء اللهم اغفر لنا ما قدمنا وما أخرنا وما أسررنا وما أعلنا وما أنت أعلم به منا أنت المقدم وأنت المؤخر لا إله إلا أنت اللهم أنت حسبنا ونعم الوكيل ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وسلام على المرسلين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته Shay, correct me if I'm wrong that it's wajib for us to practice Amar Makruf Nahi Munkar so my question is how to differentiate between not being judgmental and practicing the Ammar Ma'ruf Nahi Munkar. Jazakallah khair. Wa jazakum. I guess I explain, but I would like to explain furthermore that the quality which made this Ummah and its members superior to other nations is enjoining what is good and forbidding what is bad. In all the examples I mentioned, I've mentioned that there was the quality of enjoining what is good and forbidding what is bad. But meanwhile, you pray for the best as far as the faith and whether this person would take heed or not, would benefit of your advice or not, will end up to be a righteous person or not. That's entirely up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I give you a couple of my personal experiences with the, with the girl, the dancer, or with the... Uh, with the American tourist, whom I, I never thought that he would become Muslim. And Allah gave him an end which all Muslims long for, to die while praying. You know? So we don't know. We don't know who will end up having a good conclusion, husn al khatima, or otherwise. So we pray for that. And as long as we're still breathing, then there is still a chance. A chance to be either good, if you're bad, or to be bad, even though you've been living good all the time. Why? Because there is a hadith in this regard, even there is an arm's length between him and entering paradise and he changes. So the person must worry about his fate when it comes to judgment. But when it comes to others, your part is, as Allah the Almighty said to his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
ليس عليك هداهم ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء وهو أعلم بالمهتدي دي أدر آية في سورة القصص إنك لا تهدي من أحببت ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء وهو أعلم بالمهتدين ليس عليك هداهم means their guidance is not due upon you you're not required for guiding them you're only required to enjoin them to do what is good and for them forbid them against the evil but who will end up being good and who will end up being bad is none of our business تفضل وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته By the way enjoying what is good and forbidding what is bad are inseparable and are indivisible and whatever applies here applies there because for instance if you enjoin somebody to pray meanwhile it is inclusively included that you are forbidding him against abandoning the prayers. And when you ask somebody to quit smoking, that's forbidding what is bad. So what if he does that is enjoining what is good? صح? So the etiquette of doing either one of them is all explained in ayah number 90 of Surah An-Nahl. ادعو إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن. Look, this is the right order. And this ayah, I, I teach a course at the university called Methodology of Dawa. You find all the different methods of presenting your Dawa in this ayah. It is the cornerstone in giving Dawa. ادعو إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن. Here we got the word سبيل call unto the way of your Lord with wisdom uh, The ayah is 125 I was trying to verify 125 of Surah An-Nahl Chapter number 16. Call unto your Lord bil hikmati with wisdom. Listen to Imam Shafi'i talks about the wisdom here. He says, whenever you give an advice, he says in Arabic, an nasihatu ala al malai fadiha. An nasihatu ala al malai fadiha. Now, I'm giving a talk. And uh, while giving the talk, I need to drink. Standing on the podium, standing, not sitting. So I grab the glass and I start drinking. One of the audience, Sheikh, haram. It happened to me. I was giving a talk in Mecca, in the Hilton, and haram. What is haram? You shouldn't be drinking uh, while standing. Okay, thank you so much. Zakallah khayyab. Okay, if, 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 he, if his objection is foolish because he doesn't know, I shouldn't be foolish too, because at least I should know better. I said, in fact, you're right, it is disliked, not haram, disliked to drink while standing, but it is permissible. Because here in Mecca, 1400 years ago, 1425 years ago, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa after finishing his tawaf, Abdullah ibn Abbas gave him a glass of zamzam water and he drank while standing. <laughs> oh, I, it's a sound hadith. Why, why, why? Because al an ummati to tell them that it is not forbidden, rather it is recommended to sit down. Okay. I could have made a fool out of him in front of everyone. I could have embarrassed him and burned him. You ignorant and you don't know anything and that's why you're objecting to a scholar, yo. And you don't know. But this way, I taught him number one. And he, you know, maybe he's, maybe he's, he got carried away. He was emotional to see the sunnah being violated. You know, I do the live broadcast on my page once a week now. And we're adding another uh, Q and A session, inshallah. There is a program I do once a week called Best of the Best. I hope, inshallah, you get a chance to follow it. 
like half hour every week. Normally it's either Friday or Saturday. So because of using the front camera, it flips the objects. It switches right to the left. So I'm sitting at home and there is a beautiful calligraphy behind me. There is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And I normally have to keep drinking as you notice because I have a dry mouth. So Alhamdulillah, I'm drinking with my right hand and drinking three times. Oh my God. Sheikh Haram, Haram. Everybody, what is going on? And another one is sending to the TV so that the question will be live on air. I was very disappointed at you. You're drinking with your left hand. Would you please look at the sign above me? <sighs> it's backward. Yes, that means the right is left and the left is right. <laughs> so simply, if you just bother to ask, Sheikh, why you've been teaching us that you should eat with the right hand, drink with the right hand. I was wondering if I saw that right, you know, this is hikmah. So if the people lack hikmah when they advise you, you should lack the hikmah in replying to the foolish way of advising you. So when you point to the sign, Alhamdulillah, there was a sign and it looked uh, backward like that. This is hikmah. Choosing the right time. And Imam Shafi'i said, giving an advice to um, somebody in public is not an advice anymore. It is an exposure. It is to, it's a scandal. To scandalize him. It's a blasphemy. To expose him or her. The same words, the same words, if you speak to the person in private, this person, any person, by the way, let it be a scholar or an ordinary person, people do not like to be corrected in public. Once I've attended a lecture to a big, uh, to a scholar or to a person who's wearing a big turban, because Allah knows whether he's a big scholar or not. Thousands of people in Cairo, and he was talking about how we should celebrate the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu And there is a proof from the Quran and there is a proof from the Sunnah. And I'm going to burn those Wahhabi or Wasabi and I'm going to give them the proof. Okay. After he finished, he narrated a hadith, long hadith. Wallahi, he said in the hadith literally. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, look at the reference. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one day is such a blessed day. He said, he narrated that on the member, on front of thousands of people. Ya Mulithani, it's a day on which I was born. It's a day on which I was commissioned with the prophethood. And it's a day on which I died. I died. In the past tense. Ya Munfihi ulit. Wa ya Munfihi bu'ist. Wa ya Munfihi qubit. So I give you the literal translation. The, the khutbah was in Arabic. So after he finished, I drew near to him. And I thanked him for his marvelous speech. And Allah, I just whispered to him in the ear. I said, MashaAllah, your speech was very good. I, I want to ask about one hadith because I'm not from here. My Arabic is not that good. The hadith that you said, he said, it's a sound hadith. So when he raised his voice, people gathered and they were ready actually to beat me. Yeah, it's a sound hadith. Don't you know that? I know, I know, I'm just asking. So when he made it public, you know, I initially talked to him in private. When he made it public, I said, pardon my Arabic. I'm coming from America. I'm Egyptian originally, but I was coming from, I'm coming from America. So pardon me, my Arabic is a little bit. But you said that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that, uh, and I died on Monday. Does it make any sense? <laughs> Number one, did Allah tell him that when he will die? No. And uh, is it possible that he could have said, I died on Monday? Is it possible anyone would say that? So he said, oh, just wait for a little bit. I waited. Why? Because initially when I spoke to him, I whispered in his ear, in private. But he wanted to make it public. Now when he was cornered, he said, just give me a few minutes. I said, until people started leaving, and when people left, they said, listen, I'm sorry, I made it up. Wallahi, I'm wrong. I made it up. This is not, this part is not of the hadith. I said, I know. 
It is not of the hadith. So what are you going to do about it? <laughs> now what, what are you going to do about it? Those people were ready to beat me. What are you going to do about it? Several thousand people, several stories, and people are in the streets listening to you. And now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Man kathaba alayya muta'amidan falyatabawwa maqadahu min Allah. Let whoever lies or fabricates a statement then ascribes it to me, let him expect his seat in hellfire. He said, I shall announce next Jumu'ah that this is not a hadith. By the way, the first part is a sound hadith. Yawm al is a day on which I was born and in which I was appointed with a message. That's why he said that when he was asked, why do you fast so much on Monday? Okay? But sometimes the person, he's a big scholar. Big beard, big turban, azhar, and, and all of that. But it happens. We all make mistakes. I could have easily exposed him in front of those thousands of people and made a fool out of him. But what will happen? He will be stubborn more. And he may insist in public and say, this guy is a wasabi and whatever, and we we'll fight. And people would still believe that this is a hadith and it is not a hadith. So I believe mission is accomplished. Okay, he apologized. And he recognized that not all the audience would let go. Some time, somebody will come up and will say, hey, and it happens with me. Some of my students would come and say, Sheikh, you mentioned this hadith. May I verify its authenticity? Yes. And but uh, Sheikh Al-Albani said uh, in one of the books that this hadith is Hassan, it's not Sahih. Fine. Well, my head is not an iPhone. <laughs> you know? So we all correct each other. That is called hikmah. Mawa'id al hasana and you know, with a kind advice. But sometimes you have to end up arguing. Even argument with one which is best. Barakallah. One more question, Akhi and uh, we gotta go because we have also lectures in the morning and people have to rest for Friday. <coughs> last question. Yeah, so I'm going to ask a very simple question. Again, left How do you right. know it's simple? <laughs> it is simple. How it's do you know? Because it's left and right and right and left. Okay. Because suppose we wear the watch in left and you're wearing the right. So how this left and right is? Is it from Sunnah or your personal choice? Okay. No. It's not something from Sunnah. Because it is wherever you feel wearing it, right or left, I can wear a watch on my left. Okay, what about if somebody says, well, I heard Rasulullah says, Tayammanu. So I hope to get a word for doing so. Inshallah, you'll be rewarded for it. But to say it's a sunnah? No, don't dare to say that. Okay? Mm -hmm. A sunnah means it's something that the Prophet either did it or advised to do it. Sah? Because I heard some people, they said we should prefer the right hand, you know, for everything. I said, then cut the left hand. It's a, it's a little too extreme to, to yeah. say wear the watch in the right hand because it's a sunnah. I'm wearing it in my right hand. I feel, you know, tell you the truth. When I was young, I put it on my right hand for this reason. <laughs> then I can't change it anymore. But I have to be honest with the audience and with the people. You can wear the watch in whichever hand you want. If you have a pocket watch like those old-fashioned ones, and uh, the, they'll be very lovely. It's even better. Okay. Sometimes, you know, I deliberately take off the watch and keep it in, 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 uh, in my pocket. It's not an issue to wear it in the right, in the left. No problem. Exactly. It was simple. And why are you wearing it in your left hand, though? Shukran. <laughs> <laughs>